name of our we wish to greet you this evening in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we come to worship him even though there's really not many here this is mostly a, a live broadcast and uh, we do that so that we can still share in the spirit and the togetherness even though we're a part of being one um, it is our pleasure to be here tonight and to do this and at this time I want to uh, introduce although he doesn't need an introduction our brother Terry Patience we know that he is the president and the prophet of this church and it is good to, to hear him speak and to see what he has to say and to share of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ for our, our call to worship I have chosen from the book of John chapter 1 I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 and 13 and 14 in the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son and the gospel was the word and the word was with the Son and the Son was with God and the Son was of God the same was in the beginning with God all things were made by him and without him was not anything made which was made in him was the gospel and the gospel was the life and the life was the light of men he was born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God and the same word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth let us turn our hymnals to hymn number 96 nine six and for those who are here we will stand for the singing of this hymn him 96.
our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, we come before Thee this evening, and we ask that Your Spirit will attend with us, and that You will be with us, and that You will feed us, and that You will uplift us and stir up our souls. Father, as we worship Thee this evening, we pray that uh, we will remember Thee and that we will place our attention upon Thee. I pray again for my brother Terry that as he brings the message of this evening that you will be with him and that you will bless him in his presentation that Father we might be fed by those things which you have placed upon his heart. So we come before thee, Father, and we ask these things in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have set aside some time uh, to announce the offering. There are many who are, have still not made it back to the congregations and are still not coming again. Uh, return to coming again, so we have means of uh, giving to the church and uh, keep that part of our commandment. And, and we know them, and I, I see it is up on the screen. We, we can mail that check to the headquarters. We can call into the ch headquarters and give our credit card information. We can hand carry a check to the headquarters. We can visit the website. And on your mobile devices that support text messages, you can send to 72356. And uh, in the text message, text the keyword RCJC, and then the fund you wish to contribute to. And you probably see them on your screen. And so these are the means that the church has set up to, uh, to give. And I know that. Uh, that most every service that we broadcast, that we, uh, that we share these, but it's good to keep them fresh in our memory and to remind us of the means that we have to give. And at this time, I want to say a prayer for that money that is gathered for our church and our congregations. Our Heavenly Father, we come before Thee and we thank You, Lord, for those blessings that You have placed upon us and for your watch care and your guidance thus far. And Father, we pray that you will continue to be with us. I pray that we will always, Lord, be able to receive those things that we need, not just to function, dear Lord, but to fulfill thy ministry that you have called us unto. I pray for those who have been set aside and whose responsibilities it is to care for this money that you will bless them, Lord, that they might use it and do all things according to your will and as they are seen pleasing in your sight. So, Father, we pray for your continued blessings in these things. We ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. caught. <laughs> I have a couple of scriptures that I would like to bring to the forefront as we begin to consider the message that I think we can talk about this evening. The first one I have is taken from the book of Exodus, the third chapter, verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent you unto me, hath sent me unto you. And then going to Matthew, the fifth chapter of Matthew starting with verse 47. That ye may be the children of your Father who is in heaven, for he maketh his arm to rise on the evil and on the good, 
and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love only them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans the same. Ye are therefore commanded to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And in the book of James, the first chapter, starting with verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and enter entire wanting nothing. If any of ye lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And finally, to the Book of Mormon, turning to the Book of Moroni, the 10th chapter, starting with verse 27. And again, I would exhort you that you would come unto Christ and lay hold upon every good gift and touch not the evil gift nor the unclean thing. And awake and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem, Yea, and put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion, and strengthen thy stakes, and enlarge thy borders forever, that thou mayest no more be confounded, that the covenants of the Eternal Father, which he hath made unto thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. Yea, come unto Christ, and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness, and love the Lord God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can no wise deny the power of God. And again, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ, and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that ye become holy without spot. May God add his blessings upon the readings. At this time, we have some special music that's been selected is from a recording from the 2005 General Conference, um, and it was that conference choir singing, Seek ye first the kingdom of God.
One of the things I most dearly miss <clears throat> during this whole COVID experience, and I'm sure that's true for all of us, is uh, large congregations. Um, it was good to hear that special music and hear that choir sing with a number of people who must have been there in that. Cindy and I had kind of an, a wonderful afternoon this afternoon. We ran into a series of programs on YouTube called Songs of Praise, and it's several years of, of uh, programs that have been put on in England where they gathered together people of different communities and they would put a thousand or two thousand people in a cathedral and they would all sing favorite hymns. Some of which I knew, some of which I didn't. But it was still thrilling and a ministry to me to hear them sing. And they've been done, I think the first one was done in 1970 or 1980 and then there was just some that can kind of consistently, so they're not current, but they're certainly a minister to us, or to Cindy and I this afternoon. So I really enjoyed that, and I look forward to the time when we can do that again, when we can have a large congregation. Speaking of large congregations, most of us know that General Conference is coming up, and at this particular point, we're still on for, for uh, July 29th, that's a Wednesday night, and running then through August 2nd, which is a Sunday morning. <clears throat> we think, we being in the First Presidency, think that because of the current mandate to wear a mask, that we will be able to have General Conference and wear a mask with it. We think that's kind of a good compromise, a good trade-off with it. Uh, I wish to in all warmness of my heart, thank those who do choose to wear a mask, and there are a few of you here in the uh, congregation this evening, um, because I really feel that it's a, a love that you have for others that allows you or motivates you to wear the mask, and therefore I really appreciate it. I don't feel at this particular point that our worships have been hampered in any way, because I can't see your lips move. <laughs> I can still see your eyes. And that's really the window into the soul is the, is the eyes. So I'm glad that we're not wearing masks that cover the eyes as well. But again, I am glad that we are able to, uh, to wear a mask. And it, it was mentioned in the 12th article of faith that Joseph Smith wrote in the Wentworth letters that we as a church ought to obey the laws of the land. And at this particular point, I don't see mask as hampering our worship. So I'm grateful that many of us have chosen. I'm also a little grateful that the speaker doesn't have to wear a mask. I would probably be out of breath much, much quicker. So on with the sermon. We have a topic for tonight in case you're not aware that's entitled, The Perfection of God. I'll repeat that, The Perfection of God. And I personally, as I struggled with this, and I've known about this topic for several weeks, um, kind of said, well, yeah, God is perfect. And I think most of us will agree that God is perfect. It is, in fact, one of those beliefs that we all have to have in that God is perfect. And we must hold on to it in order to really accept the fact that God is God. So for that reason, I thought to myself, well, I could just make that statement, could I not, and just sit down. Well, I don't hear anybody agreeing that that's probably what they would prefer. So I guess I'll go on. So I'd like to, for a little bit, consider what it means that God is perfect. I don't know about you, but I feel like trying to understand that God is perfect, or even the sheer concept of perfection as being something beyond me. I am not perfect. I don't think anybody would tell you that I am perfect. And I wouldn't necessarily want to tell anyone else that they were perfect. 
So I totally understand why it's a little bit hard for us to comprehend what perfection really means. We live, as we all know, in a very broken world, which we call our mortal life. We see problems that people have. We see decay in our world. If I don't mow my yard, it falls apart. It uh, weeds overtake it. If I uh, have a water leak in my house and I don't fix it, it won't be very long until my house turns into decay, etc. We live in a broken world. Our psyches are oftentimes broken. Our desires are broken, and so forth. Our society is not perfect. And again, I think that, I'm just making the same statement again, I think again that condition makes it very difficult for us to wrap our minds around what is meant by saying that God is perfect. Anybody got any ideas? Well, one way that I tried to come up with to solve the dilemma of trying to talk about God and his perfection is to try to consider some of the attributes of God and what he is and what he has, in a sense, done for us. So I've got a list here of five attributes. These are not all that I found. I found one website that listed 12 attributes of God. But, and I wasn't disagreeing with all 12. I just thought I'm not necessarily going to discuss all 12. The first one on my list is God is holy. What does that mean to you? To think that God is holy. If you were back in high school or junior high and God or your teacher asked you to write a paper on that subject or even a paragraph on that subject, God is holy, what words would you use? How about unsinful? Okay. How about moral? Okay. And I'm sure that there are others. But once again, we're finding difficulty in describing this perfection of God. Number two on my list was love. We have heard that since we were little tykes, where we've heard the phrase, God is love. What does that mean? How do you put that into your paragraph that you're writing? I have a couple of words, unselfish, I think that's relatively obvious, even though God does things because he wants to do things, but yet he's doing them out of love, not out of his self-desire to cause things to happen that might be uncomfortable for us. The second word on my love bullet is charity. And the Book of Mormon does an awesome job of talking about charity. Many chapters. Good study material. But basically, I would define charity as giving up oneself. I talked a little bit about our broken society, and I think that's one of the problems that we have in a lot of our people within society is that they are unwilling to give up of themselves, especially in today's generation of I and me and I want and so forth and so on, and you all know the, the words that would be used there. We are told to be charitable towards one another. We are told to love one another, to prefer our brothers and sisters. There are many descriptions that we could use for this charity. Many things we could discuss about giving up oneself. The third bullet was goodness. And one dictionary used benevolence a 
along with that goodness. I remember a couple of years ago, I ran across that word benevolence, and I thought to myself, what does that mean? Because I don't know that I had heard it. But it's this charitable heart that God has, is that he is willing to do anything and everything for us that we might be able to achieve, achieve the ultimate goal that he has set forth for us. That's God's benevolence, even to the giving up of his son. Also, along with goodness, there's words like long-suffering. And I am so thankful that God is long-suffering. I'm nearly 71 years old. And I can think back throughout my life that I have not perhaps been the best person that I could have been all of those 71 years. And I'm glad that God is long-suffering and still loving me, still caring about me, still nurturing me, still trying to bring me into what he wants me to become. He is indeed long-suffering. Merciful, also along with his goodness. And I think that again relates back to his benevolence and how he feels and directs himself towards us. The fourth word on the Gola points is om omnipresent. Now that's a tough one for me to think about and try to understand what that might mean. It means basically he is present everywhere. I can't do that. I can't be here and at home or at my daughter's house or the other daughter's house or my son's house or at Blue Springs or at First Branch all at the same time or in India or Africa or anywhere else, but he can. And I don't understand how he does that, but I know that he does. Fifth one on my bullet points was righteous. And basically the definition that was given was to be morally correct and justifiable. Indeed, I believe God is morally correct in all of his decisions. So that's some of the attributes of God in my five bullet point list. Another way to try to understand how God is perfect is to observe what we can see and hear and experience, and experience those things that are fulfilling in the creation that God has given us. I uh, love flowers, especially when they're fairly new and they're still fairly perfect. A rose that has just come forth, a peony that has just blossomed and come forth, a cactus flower that has long awaited some rain so that it could bring forth a flower. Those flowers are beautiful. They're so perfect in what they're supposed to do and how they look and how they appear. And I can enjoy that kind of perfection. And if I'm really in tune with God, I think I can look at those objects of nature and say, there's some perfection of God. Is it not? Having studied music in college, one of the things that we had to do was a rather lengthy, gruesome two-year course on music theory, where you begin to understand the chords and the makeup of our Western culture's music, all the different nuances, all of the different things that flow from one chord to another chord, one note into another note that makes it sound rather inviting. There is in music what they call the dominant note. If I'm working in the key of C, the dominant is C. And I could go to the piano and I could play middle C or an octave above or an octave above or below or below. And that sound ought to be perfect, unless, for some reason, the piano hasn't been tuned for a while. If you've looked inside a piano, and it's kind of a fascinating place to go, 
But for every note, there's a, there's a little hammer that comes up and bangs on that set of strings. And I say a set of strings because there's usually three strings for most of the middle keys of our keyboards. Three strings. Have you ever heard a piano that all three of those three strings don't match? Yes, I'm sure we have. So if they don't match, it's less than a perfect sound. Then if you take a chord and you try to add the fifth, which is five notes up the scale, and that adds a little different tonality to what you're playing, you've got your first, your dominant, and your fifth, and then you can also add the third, and you have a perfect major chord. And as long as all of those notes are perfect, it sounds wonderful. You can make it minor by changing the third down a half step. But that can still be a pleasing tone. You can add the seventh of the scale to your dominant chord, the one, three, five, and now the seven, and it has a little different tonality. It has a little bit more dissonant to it, not quite as pleasing. It's kind of like a little bit of a driving tone that wants to be, in musical terms, resolved. It wants to move into the dominant note again. And in fact, if you start looking at how musical pieces are put together, most often, when you get toward the last few notes of a piece, you find that the notes are in the fifth of the scale, possibly adding some of the seventh because it's driving you into and back to the dominant key, whatever key that might be. And that feels comforting and relaxing to the body and to the ear when that resolution takes place. Again, as long as all the strings are working together. And it takes a wonderful piano tuner. There's a real knack, a really good ear, a little bit of training, well, maybe a lot of training, for a piano tuner to be able to sit down and take all 88 keys that are on a keyboard and make them sound like they're supposed to sound so that it's pleasing to you, to us. And it becomes perfect. Now, there are some musical pieces by composers especially going back about 150 years ago, that to me don't sound quite so perfect because they tried to do too much. They're less simple. I personally like the Baroque period where it's a little bit simpler, a little bit more straightforward with it. But that's just my opinion. What's perfect? In the sense of the musical tones. What do you hear as being perfect, pleasing? What do you hear as being a ministry unto you. Again, what I'm trying to do with this is just try to give you some concept of what perfection might be. We've talked about the beauty of nature and the perfectness of that in some situations and also now the musical chord and how that might be perfect or less perfect with it. Matt called me up Friday, I think it was, and asked me if there was a hymn that I might like for tonight's service. And I did a little thinking about it and called him back and said, yes, I would like to have us sing hymn number 101. And we're gonna use that as our closing hymn tonight. I picked that hymn because I think it also is another way of helping us to consider God's perfection. The words are, Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord of hosts, Almighty One. Earth and firmament speak thy praise. Thy name is written in the sun. Thou hast fashioned with thine own hand the earth below, the heavens above. Oh, how wonderful is thy power, and yet high how tender is thy love. O thou infinite living God, upon us now thy spirit pour, we would worship thee 
laud and praise thy holy name forevermore. Great and marvelous are thy works. Sing of his mighty love, for it is wonderful. Let his praise throughout the earth resound. Honor and majesty now and forever be unto him alone, wherever man is found. Nature, perfection. Music, perfection. How about you? You are a creature, something that the creator has created. Creature is not a nice word, because I usually associate that with a frog or something to that effect. You are a creation of God. Mankind is a creation of God. And one of the things that we are to do is to sing of his mighty love. And I think it is easy to do that when we begin to realize just how perfect he is. Well, let us continue in our exploration for a little bit here, this concept of perfection. So I'd like to take a look at some definitions of the word. I know Matt does this because every now and then he'll refer back to the 1830 dictionary. Yep. And others of us will do the same thing so that we can try to begin to understand a little bit more about what the word might mean. So perfect. Flip, flip, flip. There it is in the dictionary. As a noun, the condition, state, or quality of being free as possible from all flaws or defects. The condition or state or quality of being free as possible from all flaws or defects. Does that describe God? In our minds it does. I agree. Now what does it mean to be free of flaws and defects? I'm not there. Hard for me to relate, again. The 1830 dictionary says that it is a personal standard, an attitude or philosophy that demands perfection and rejects anything else. A personal standard or philosophy that demands. To me, demanding something is still kind of trying to work towards that perfection. Now, I don't believe that God works towards perfection. He just is. But you and I, on the other hand, yeah, we can be working towards some degree of perfection. We can, as we walk through our lives, try to do everything we can to reject anything that God does not want us to have in our life. And as we do that, we get closer and closer to being what God wants us to be, what he created us to be. The American Dictionary defines perfect as the highest degree of goodness of holiness of which man is capable of in this life. And it used words like completeness and consummate. Here again, a little bit of that putting our minds forward into some kind of a condition that we might obtain to or desire to or work towards. Other words used in the dictionary for the word perfect are words like ultimate, absolute, fully informed. Ooh, I like this one, but certainly haven't achieved it. Perfect in discipline. How about nothing wanting? If I have created the perfect musical piece and that perfect musical piece ends and it's like the mind and the ears just, yes, it's done. That was wonderful. That ministered to me. Kind of like the hymns Cindy and I were singing or hearing this afternoon. They were people, lots of people, singing hymns together in unison and in parts, and they did a wonderful job. And then it resolved towards the end. It went through that tonic chord into the dominant chord, 
and the music ended. And you just kind of wanted to take a sigh of relief and realize that you had been ministered to. It was nearly perfection. I also wondered, <coughs> excuse me, what perfection or perfect might mean in Hebrew. This book was not written in English. This book was not written yesterday. And when the people who put this book together wrote it down in Hebrew and in Greek, perhaps what they were thinking of <coughs> when they wrote it down was perhaps not the same understanding that I might have of perfect and perfection. <coughs> the Hebrew words for perfection used things like integrity, completeness, whole, with purpose. I have heard that term completeness and whole before, and I have tried to put that into the scriptures, even some of the scriptures that I read for our scripture reading. And I think they fit, because it is the men of the scriptures who wrote the scriptures who were trying to get those people and us to see that it is an accomplishable thing to be able to become whole. Now, what does whole mean? I've got water up here, thank you. Whole to me means that I have become what the creator of me wants me to be. Does that make some sense? I have become what my creator wants me to be. And it is perhaps that the only one who can really understand what that might be for me is him. For what I think I'm understanding is that the wholeness for me may be slightly different than the wholeness might be for Matt or for others. Is what Matt may be capable of is maybe a little different than what I am capable of or what I have been designed to do. Matt has a wonderful bass voice and when he sings bass it sounds good and if you put Matt with a tenor and a soprano and an alto his deep voice really sounds even better. He's whole when he's singing down here. I can't get there. <laughs> my voice doesn't go that low. And the older I got, and the more higher my voice gets. So maybe my whole is a little different than his whole in that sense. It's still a matter of any one of us becoming that which God wants us to be. And the only way to maybe find out what that is, that in that we might be perfect, is to ask the creator who created us, what is it, Lord? What is it, God, that you want of me? And then you have to stop and listen and to obey. Now, I've mentioned somewhat the difficulty we have <clears throat> with these definitions. I came up there with five different dictionaries and five different concepts of perhaps what perfect or perfection is. And in all of these definitions, I can easily see where it is man, whether it be Webster or Miriam or anybody else who's writing a dictionary, trying to put down to the best of their ability to try to understand using other words that we have in our English language or Hebrew or Greek and saying this is what we think it means, this is what we think our definition of. And then we have the problem of it changing. From 1830 until now it may be a little different. And from the year zero when Christ was walking the earth or thereabouts, it may be different than what it is today. 
which makes it even more difficult, I think, for us to wrap our heads around the idea of perfection. But certainly, the perfection of God is something that we can meditate upon. It is something that the Holy Spirit can work with you upon and try to teach you what that might mean. But again, some of that might be lost because we do not have a perfect language or the perfect experiences or the perfect example other than Jesus Christ himself that allows us to begin to comprehend it. I firmly believe that one of the things we must do is to trust that God is perfect. Agreed? God is perfect. Whatever that may mean in my meager mind, whatever it may mean in James's mind or Moses's mind, we still have to accept that fact that God is perfect. I read to you in the scriptures, going back to them again, there it is, the third chapter of Genesis, and we can hear again the words, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Is that all we need? Is just to understand the great I am is the great I am. Another part of our problem with trying to com uh, contemplate or to meditate upon perfection of God is not only that we don't understand the language sometimes, but that we try to put it into the context of our own lives. And we have a dilemma because in some places in the scriptures, mankind has been asked to be perfect. For example, Matthew 5, 50. And these are very short. Ye are therefore commanded to be perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. We could also read in the scriptures from Romans, the third chapter, the 23rd verse, which reads, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm going to lead, <clears throat> read just a little bit beyond to verse 23. Reading 23 again, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I know that I am not perfect, not only because I know that I'm not perfect, but because the scripture tells me that I have sinned and every one of us has done the same. It goes on to say, and then verse 24, Therefore, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is only in Jesus Christ whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Christ. And then I read in the 10th chapter of Moroni, reading again, and again I would exhort you that ye would come unto Christ and lay hold upon every good gift which touched not the evil gift nor the unclean thing. And again, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ, if ye are perfect in Christ and deny not his power, then ye are sanctified in Christ 
by the grace of God through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that you become holy without spot. Little side note was to wonder about how many people, and you probably have heard this as well, have said to themselves something like, well, I can't be perfect because I just know who I am, or I'm not perfect, or I, I just, I'm not going to try anymore. So therefore, I'm not going to follow Jesus Christ or accept his atoning work for me. Many, many people have turned away from the gospel or have fallen short of doing what they could do because they think this perfection is unobtainable. Some have even argued against the gospel based upon the idea that mankind cannot be perfect, therefore the gospel can't be perfect. It can't be. It can't be true. And it becomes easier and easier for those people to say, I can never be perfect, so I'm not even going to try. And they walk out of the churches. Perhaps we can see ourselves in our careers. I ended up being an optician for some 25, 30 years. And I know that I walked as an optician that was an imperfect optician. I did my very best, but I was undoubtedly not the perfect optician. Maybe close. How about those of us who tried to do sports? I was too small for football. They could have used me for the football. I was too short for basketball. But I could swim. And so I tried to be a swimmer. But I know that I was never a perfect swimmer. There was always somebody, not just a Mark Phelps, but there was always somebody in my school who could outswim me. So I was not a perfect swimmer. How about our hobbies? Is there somebody that can do whatever it is we do and then do it better? More than likely. How about my music? Can I sit down at the piano and play something? Sure. Can somebody else sit down and play it more perfectly? Oh, yeah. Doesn't mean I should stop trying. And I think that's where sometimes we fall short. Well, there's always somebody else out there who can do it better. Therefore, I will stop trying. Yep, that's true. I could always be better. And that there usually is someone who could do it better. Ironically, and interestingly enough, there are a few scriptures, which I'm going to read here real quickly, who are was right word there scriptures that were given to people in the scriptures that have to do with perfection starting with the first chapter of Genesis verse 27 and I God said unto mine only begotten which was with me from the beginning let us make man in our image after our likeness and it was so hmm if we are made in the image of God, does that mean that I can become perfect and be like him? I think so. Genesis 8, 16. And thus Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, for Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And he walked with God and also his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis 17, 1 and 2. And when Abraham was ninety and nine years old, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I, the Almighty God, give unto thee a commandment, that thou shalt walk uprightly before me and be perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee. Here's a clue of how we can obtain some degree of perfection. 
walk uprightly before God. And we will begin to fulfill those things that God wants us to fulfill. Psalm, the 18th chapter, 30, 32. O oh God, thy ways are perfect. He's given us the instruction. He's telling us what to do. He's helping us every step of the way. He has provided the atonement. He has provided the, everything that we need that we might be able to walk up, uprightly with God and to try to eventually obtain perfection in what he wants us to be. O oh God, thy ways are perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those who trust in him. For all is God save the Lord. Or who is the rock save our God? Or our God that girdeth me with strength and maketh me my way perfect. James 1.4 But let patience have its perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then I read in that scripture again, If any of you lack wisdom, we know this scripture, we know it by heart. It is so precious to the story of the restoration for it's what Joseph was reading, which took Joseph into the grove, which allowed Joseph to have the manifestation of Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. And they told Joseph what Joseph needed to do. Did Joseph always walk uprightly before the Lord? He admits in some of his testimonies that he did not. But he always came back. He always repented. He always saw himself as wanting to be better and more than what he was, that he might become perfected through the work of Jesus Christ. Moroni 10.29, Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him. Section 76.5Q, These are they who are just men made perfect through Jesus the mediator of the new covenant who wrought out this perfection, perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood. These are they whose bodies are celestial. Is that our goal? To be a body celestial now, in the future? I hope so. I hope so. For I know, and perhaps you know, that if I don't succeed in returning back to Heavenly Father and being able to be there a whole, finished, unwanting person, that I will be disappointed in myself. I mentioned earlier that we today might have different twists on the work of perfection. I also stated that because we define perfection as being ultimate and absolute, we might turn away from our attempts to achieve it. We might even ask ourselves whether we think God, that somehow or another God is asking us to do something crazy. I can't be perfect. And yet he does ask us to do that. The Old and New Testament scriptures that we have just read and the one from the Book of Mormon and the one from Doctrine and Covenants have said that it is possible someday for us to become like him and to be more perfect than we are. When I become all that God intends for me to become, then I am complete. When I become all that God intends for me to become, then I am whole. I become all that God intends for me when I walk uprightly before him. When I walk uprightly before him, I have reached maturity. When I repent, I am repaired and can mend my life that I might be whole and complete. I am complete when I walk 
with Jesus Christ. Yes, I definitely believe God is perfect. He always was. He always will be. And we cannot necessarily comprehend fully what that means. But we can trust that it is true and believe in who he is. We can study his words. We can look to the complete example of Jesus Christ, his son. We can study and look at the nature that surrounds us. We can listen to music that is done to near perfection. We can see those wonderful attributes of God as they are manifest in the people who are around us. And fellow saints, we should be exemplifying those attributes towards others so that they can see what God is like. We can accept the work of the Savior. We can become ministers to each other. And by so doing, we can have a more perfect walk with Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. I'm going to leave you with one last scripture taken from the first Peter chapter 5, 6 through 11. And it reads, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that you may exalt you, that he may exalt you in time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of grace, who, doth, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for those who have shown up. And uh, also uh, thank you for all those that have watched on the live stream. As Terry has always really given away for our last hymn, we will sing hymn 101, 101, and uh, after which we will have our benediction and conclude our service, 101.
most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. We come to the close of this service. And Father, we wish to thank Thee for Your Spirit which has been here, for this message, Lord, that has been given. And I pray, Lord, that we can find that perfection within ourselves as You have commanded us to be. And yet, as our brother has stated, Lord, we cannot do it without Thee. So bless us in this endeavor, Lord, so that we can move forward, so that we can draw closer to Thee, and that we can truly be Your people. I pray, Lord, that as we come to the end of this service, that You will be with us, that You will watch us as, and bless us as we go our separate ways, and that we continue on in our week, that we will remember you, that we will have your blessings, and that you will uh, watch over us and guide us, dear Father. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.